One of the things that, that Lars and I are most excited about regarding the MFM group is the ability to bring together all of the relevant stakeholders, including policymakers and practitioners. And one of the things that we're, we're proudest of is the fact that the interaction between the policymakers, practitioners, and students have generated all sorts of really interesting thesis topics, dissertations, and uh, ultimately uh, tremendous uh, research. So uh, I'm going to start by asking each of our panelists to speak for maybe five or ten minutes just to give us uh, their views on financial stability and uh, progress and challenges. Uh, and then um, we'll open it up for general uh, audience Q&A, and um, I'll have a few questions of my own to, uh, to ask of them. Um, so I'll start with some very brief introductions, but then I'll maybe I'll, I'll ask each of the individuals to say a few words about uh, their own backgrounds. Uh, uh, to to our, our most immediate left uh, is uh, Wilson Irvin, who is currently vice chair of the group executive committee of Credit Suisse. Before that, he was uh, the chief risk officer of, of CS. Uh, then uh, Tobias Adrian is financial counselor at the IMF uh, and um, uh, is no stranger to the MFM group. He's been here on, on many occasions. Uh, Nellie Lang, who is uh, now at the uh, Brookings Institution. Before that, she was a director of the Division of Financial Stability at the, uh, the Federal Reserve. Uh, and of course, uh, Dick Berner, who's also been no stranger to MFM, uh, was uh, uh, currently at NYU um, as a lecturer, but uh, before that was uh, the, uh, the initial, the founding director of the Office of Financial Research. So um, with that, let me uh, start uh, by asking uh, Wilson, maybe say a few words, and then we'll go to the, uh, to the right. Um, I start off with the top 10 list, uh, for those of you who remember David Letterman. Uh, but it's, uh, it's come down to eight, so hopefully I can get that done in the, my five minutes. I want to talk about uh, areas that, at least from my seat, I don't see enough um, consensus or academic work on. It may well exist. I don't naturally live in this world. I live more in, in the business side of things. Uh, but I spend a lot of time on policy issues, and so these are some of the issues where I've uh, I felt a little bit that we could use some help from academia. Uh, let's start with capital. Uh, it's an interesting divide uh, that nearly all academics I run into think more capital is relatively low cost, according to Milo Medigliani, and nearly all bankers think it's expensive. Probably the only place where I've seen someone try to reconcile these is some work by uh, Baker and Wergler on the low risk anomaly that I thought might help explain this issue. But it's a, it's a big area. It has huge implications for how much capital banks carry and whether we're at a good place or a bad place. Um, and to date, I think a lot of the debates there have seemed fairly sterile. Um, second issue that comes up in this area, uh, capital is far higher now, but the distance to a minimum is much lower. So for someone in my seat as a banker, do I feel richer and more flexible than before, that I can absorb a downturn? Or is my distance to a regulatory constraint tighter, and I need to be more pro-cyclical into the next recession? Now, Credit Suisse is not that much of a credit bank outside Switzerland. We're more of an uh, investment bank globally and a private bank globally. Um, but if I was more of a traditional bank, and I was thinking about my distance to my regulatory bound, is the new system more pro-cyclical than the one we replaced? That begs a larger question. How will we use capital requirements? Uh, will they be used dynamically? Uh, do we believe in macro pru or implicit macro pru through CCAR? I have a theory that CCAR is actually a countercyclical buffer in disguise. Um, some of that is informed by the, <coughs> uh, the increase we've seen during the Terulo era. Um, but some people say, well, that was just Dan's way of getting more capital in the system slowly without kind of shocking everybody day one. Um, so, but it is an interesting question. How will it be used going forward? I have a theory that partly because of the way we describe it in terms of uh, unemployment variables, that some of the states may be somewhat anchored that the, the net shock of CCAR, which is for most people the binding constraint of capital, that that shock may shrink in a recession. But when I talk to people in the Fed, they say, oh, no, we don't talk that way. So big question. I don't have the answer on that. Resolution. Um, ben Bernanke said, too big to fail was the central lesson of the last crisis in FCIC testimony. Yet I hear it discussed almost not at all in academia. We put a trillion dollars of bail-in capital into the big eight banks. Shouldn't that affect some of these discussions? How will we use that? Uh, Tim Geithner sometimes says, oh, we can't use that because the only thing that really solves a true financial panic is getting the state involved. <laughs> 
but getting the state involved is politically hugely toxic. So I think we do need to use these resources. I think it also solves something else that Tim worries about, which is sort of the <coughs> key behavioral effect. How do we discipline bankers in a way they understand? Uh, having worked on a trading floor, hitting a couple of them on the head with a very large hammer in public view is often a very clear signal to bankers. Um, so how do we develop a system that can do that effectively without hurting people that you don't want to hurt? You don't want the hammer to be so big that hits Tobias and Nelly and not just Wilson. Um, liquidity. Policy here is mutated hugely as well. Uh, the LCR policy we have today, I think, has big stigma effects. Uh, having been a chief risk officer in the last crisis, stigma was a very present and real thing. And in fact, I think we didn't pay enough attention at my bank to stigma effects. We participated at the Fed's request in some uh, liquidity policy moves for which we were later criticized. So I think at least some of my learning is be very careful about stigma, even more so than last time when we were quite aware of it. That said, uh, we see a lot of papers in LCR, but for many of the big banks, LCR is no longer binding. It's either local liquidity traps that build up to a consolidated level, or it's things like the RLAP trigger within a resolution plan, which is completely opaque. Uh, a very unusual element of policy, but a huge factor in terms of how banks capitalize and think about their liquidity. Cross-border cooperation is another big thing on my list. I think we're in the middle of a regulatory run to trap capital inside national borders. Uh, we built a little toy model of how much this could affect bank solvency. And depending on your view of banks and contagion across subsidiaries, I think that could raise bank solvency risk compared to a, a perfectly liquid system by 5 to 15x. That's huge. That's not even thinking about the liquidity trapping portions of this. Now, I do think some of that is mitigated by the extra capital we built up, as well as TLAC. But that seems like a huge deadweight loss to the system that no one's talking about. There are also huge implications for the EU banking union, uh, in particular with respect to that, where despite the fact they call it a banking union, um, even within the EU banking union, I think conditions there have been getting worse and more nationally trapped than EU trapped. Um, why don't I stop there, and we'll, we can come back to some of these in, in later debates. Thank you. Uh, Tobias? Yeah, so I think uh, Wilson touched upon uh, three very, very important uh, topics in banking, which is that since the global financial crisis, the banks have a lot more capital, a lot more liquidity, and there's a resolution system. So as a result, I would say that the banking system uh, on net is safer today than it was 10 years ago or so. At the same time, we have seen a growing share of market-based finance. So the share of credit intermediation through markets has increased. And that is particularly true in the US, but it also holds globally. And so one of the questions is, uh, how safe is market-based finance? And so here I would say that uh, we don't see the shadow banking system from a decade ago anymore. And what characterized the shadow banking system from before the crisis was a sharp deterioration of underwriting standards through the securitization machinery and a tight linkage in between the shadow banking system and the banking system. So the banks would write credit lines to the shadow banks, to SIFs, to conduits, and other uh, off-balance sheet vehicles. And so as a result, there was a massive amount of maturity transformation. So you would have bad credit, a lot of maturity transformation. So that's a recipe for disaster. Today's market-based financial system is much more characterized via credit intermediation through the corporate bond market, through leveraged loans, or through CLOs that are repackaging leveraged loans which I would say is much safer than what we saw 10 years ago. But that doesn't mean that there aren't risks, right? So there's a lot less leverage, right? Because the typical asset manager, the typical mutual fund has a lot less leverage than an off-balance sheet vehicle from 10 years ago. But still, there's some maturity transformation. And there's this question. We don't quite know how uh, asset management be, uh, investors are going to behave if the credit cycle is turning given that the share of market-based credit intermediation is so much larger, and so the investor base 
necessarily has changed somewhat. So I think there's a question mark. And so I think the, the, the question going forward is sort of like, are we going to see a very sharp deterioration in financial conditions? So that might not lead to the systemic crisis that we saw 10 years ago, because there's so much more capital and liquidity in the banks. So we're not going to worry that like, you know, uh, a, a large fraction of the banking system is going to go bust over the next month or so. But we might see very, very sharp adjustment in asset prices and we know from lots of literature that people here in this room have contributed to that tightening of financial conditions typically has macro consequences. So there's a feedback loop, an adverse feedback loop in between the price of risk in the economy and macro activity. And it's typically a deterioration in the price of risk is forecasting uh, a downturn in, in, in the short term. So our current financial stability assessment is that you know, short-term risks are uh, increasing somewhat. Financial conditions have tightened somewhat. But globally, they remain around neutral in the US. Even after the sell-off uh, of the fall, financial conditions remain somewhat easy. But there could be a sharp tightening at some point. And indeed, last year, we have seen twice this very, very sharp spike in volatility that came down very quickly again. But we might again see uh, this type of uh, market turbulence going forward. And that could be market critical. Looking around the world, I think, uh, um, you know, basically, there are worries about downside risks going forward globally. Uh, as well as in the US. And that has led to a fairly sizable uh, macroeconomic adjustment uh, in the US, mainly in the form of monetary policy expectations, right? I mean, the Fed funds path is totally flat, even adjusting for term premium uh, going forward, while it was you know, somewhat upside sloping last year. Uh, in Europe, there has been uh, also some adjustment in terms of monetary policy expectations, but primarily an adjustment in terms of fiscal stance. And in China, where financial conditions have tightened quite dramatically over the past year, both monetary and fiscal policies have been eased. Uh, Japan also has seen an easing of fiscal policy. So basically, uh, in recent months, uh, the IMF has downgraded uh, the forecast for growth and has increased sort of like uh, the assessment of downside risks. And there is already a policy response around the world. And the question is, is this going to, enough, to be enough to contain the downside risks and to contain the adverse feedback mechanisms from financial vulnerabilities such as high leverage, maturity transformation, and currency mismatches? Thank you. Nelly? Hi. Um, so I thought I'd make a few remarks um, around the kind of broad approach of um, is the macroprudential policy framework. And the idea here is, um, have we really accomplished any macro pru, or have we just done better microprudential? And um, so just starting with, like, building on Irwin's comments, um, starting with Basel III, so we have liquidity regulations now. There's not a lot of research on liquidity. There's a lot of, on capital that's been building. But I think some attention to liquidity regulations. Um, there are now $3 trillion of assets and liquid assets on banks' balance sheets. That's 20% of their assets. And in 2008, liquid assets were about 4%. So this is like this massive change. And I'm not sure that we fully understand what those implications are. I certainly don't think we've <laughs> solved the last taxi problem. Like, what is going to happen when stress happens? Are banks going to actually draw down their liquidity or hoard it? And I think that's sort of still an open question. There's sort of a little bit of a longer term question on liquidity regulations, which is the largest institutions have not just the LCR, it's the resolution liquidity standards, which are very opaque. Um, are they going to, are the ins, big institutions going to have to compete for deposits in ways they've never had to um, in a different way? You know, if the Fed shrinks its balance sheets and reserves start to go down, they need deposits. Is this going to change the way the nature of deposit competition has been? And, you know, are banks going to get more concentrated? I think there are some long-term interesting questions to think about. 
Um, on capital, um, I'll just say a couple words and maybe we can talk a little bit more because everyone mentioned um, whether CCAR is really um, the countercyclical capital buffer in disguise. Um, but clearly, stress tests are, you know, this big improvement in supervision and have certainly achieved a lot of good uh, micro credential. Um, they are forward looking, so they're supposedly, they should be better uh, measures. Um, and they are designed to offset inherent procyclicality, but they are not the same thing as a CCYB. And the US has a framework for, for setting CCYB. And actually, all countries, all Basel III countries now have a framework for it. Um, but actually, implementing it is, is, is a big step. And um, communicating to banks and the public why you would do it, especially if you have stress tests, I think is a, is a challenge. Um, outside of Basel III, one area that I think is um, really important and something I've been working on and off with Tobias over the years is um, the effects of financial regulations and uh, monetary policy. And sort of just lots of facets to this issue. And you think, so one big question is, um, suppose you have a monetary economy with a lower potential growth, and you've got monetary policy at lower rates for than, than in the past. Every recession that comes along, there's sort of less scope for monetary policy to, to move. And what does that imply for capital regulations? I mean, does it imply something? I think it does. But have we worked through that kind of thing? I think the answer is um, we haven't done very much in that yet with a world of lower potential growth, if you, if you agree with that. Um, and does it, that, should that have some effect on um, capital requirements? Um, the last thing I want to mention is um, something that I've been working on quite a bit lately. This is what you get to do when you leave the Fed. You can just kind of work on what you want. And, um, and it has to do with who's actually responsible for implementing macro prudential policies. So I think most, most you know, in models and whatnot, we just kind of assume there's somebody, a responsible entity, for implementing these kinds of policies. And, um, and it turns out it's, it's not true. And, and then there are some important things like why it's important. So macro pru is sort of like, you can think of it as monetary policy. It kind of needs to be forward looking. And you have to be sort of willing to take away the punch bowl. Um, so you kind of want some independence. And you probably want some macro skills. So that sounds like a central bank. And more so than, say, a prudential regulator, because you have the, um, the macro skills. Um, but macro pru also has a little bit of element of some political, you know, if you're trying to restrain credit growth or you, you know, or you may be at odds with a uh, social policy to expand home ownership. So you kind of want the political part, part of the economy involved in that. So then you get government and elected officials. And then they, of course, have a different sort of, um, what you would call inaction bias for obvious reasons. So kind of looking at how countries have set this up, um, we've taken a look at uh, 58 countries. And these are the countries that the IMF has in databases put as those who have used tools in the past, who are sort of active. And it's, it's, you know, it's basically most of world GDP. Um, and there's been this huge growth in what are called financial stability committees. Um, 47 of the 58 of them have financial stability committees now. And most of them started after the crisis. Um, most all of them had the central bank and the prudential regulator. But many of them had the Ministry of Finance. And they're often the chair, um, which I think is sort of says something about the way governments are thinking about implementing some of these policies. Um, no country created a single new entity with its own authority. These are all sort of committees. Um, what's kind of interesting is many of them can't actually take actions. They have very few powers. Um, the UK, the France, uh, Malaysia, these committees can actually direct actions or take actions themselves. But most of them are more for um, coordinating or information sharing. Um, so that raises different kinds of things. And, and then you say, well, could the central bank do this? And you know, obviously, every country has a central bank. And they could be good. 
Um, but they, you know, they have monetary policy, they have lender of last resort policy that they can't sort of give away. That's not something they can delegate to elsewhere. And it appears countries really don't want them to be the monetary policy maker, the micro prudential policy maker, and the macro prudential policy maker. So I think this is just raising kinds of questions about like, is um, how effective will it be? And you know, can we? Um, is there something to to be doing here? If so I've been trying to raise those issues, um, I guess I would just say I don't think it is the best structure for the central bank to do it all. Um, certainly could reduce policy inertia. Might do better policy, but it does risk independence of uh, monetary policy. Um, and so, you know, coming from a central bank, that conclusion came to me very slowly. It just it was very uh, hard to make that conclusion. And it's not to say monetary pol the central bank ha can ignore financial stability risks. It has to consider it. It's not a third term in some t rule. But um, I think it needs to consider it. It just can't assume that somebody else is out there to do it well. Um, so, okay, so that's my, I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you. Dick? Thanks, uh, Andrew. Thanks for having me. Um, well, as the cleanup batter, I'll kind of summarize a little bit what others have said and also point out some things that I think are, are, are pretty important. So I think we all agree that the financial system is more resilient today than prior to the crisis, uh, primarily in banks, um, thanks to both of the reforms that we talked about here and better risk management. And as Tobias indicated, the most toxic forms of market-based finance are uh, in remission, hopefully for good. But um, you know that remains to be seen. Um, I think that, um, nonetheless, we can't be complacent uh, about the financial vulnerabilities that can be exposed <laughs> by shocks that, that can arise. And we've seen some of them, Tobias alluded to, uh, rising corporate leverage, deteriorating credit. Uh, uh, underwriting and credit quality, and there are some structural vulnerabilities that are, I think are, are maybe smaller now, but persist um, in market-based finance and, and maybe uh, in some other areas. I think that the point that um, uh, we've all made about focusing not just on banks, but the whole financial system is really the essence of macroprudential analysis and policy. Uh, and that means focusing inherently on uh, non-bank financial institutions, and on markets. And I don't think there's been enough work either uh, by academics um, or by people in policy positions uh, on uh, thinking about that, how to make those institutions more resilient um, so that we get away from too big to fail if it exists, how to make markets more resilient so that they are not just fair and effective, but also um, in the face of shocks that they can still function, and what are the things that are needed um, in that regard? So Nellie alluded to the sort of, if you will, a little bit of a collective action or political economy problems where, um, you know, <clears throat> macro prudential authorities um, or central banks or micro prudential authorities, or if they're all combined in one big committee, are kind of reluctant to act. And frankly, in the United States, I think, um, you know, we've had some aspects of the post-crisis reforms that uh, limited the tools that the Fed and other officials have to fight the next financial crisis. Not just because there's less space for fiscal or monetary policy, but also uh, because there's a limit on providing liquidity to solvent non-bank financial institutions. And I think that um, that's really uh, pretty important as uh, that grows uh, in importance. Um, on another area related to that, um, I'm concerned that uh, you know, we're looking for a balance between making sure there's resilience, but also right-sizing regulation. That's been a, a theme that is evident in all the reports that came out of the Treasury Department. Um, and the discussion about where, you know, where, what is the right balance between, as the Treasury puts it, effective, efficient, and appropriately tailored uh, on one hand and resilient um, uh, on the other. Um, and I think more work can be done on that. Uh, to try to assess where that balance uh, might be. So, for example, um, you know, if the, the pendulum can swing back too far, I think that in some cases the proposals that we've seen lately might have done that. Um, for example, raising the threshold for reducing the frequency of stress tests uh, could blindfold us, I think, to um, emerging risks. And that's different from reducing the burden of stress testing, which I think is a laudable uh, 
a laudable goal. There's no question in my mind that we can at least seek to make stress testing less of a, uh, a check the box and burdensome uh, kind of exercise and something that really enables people to focus um, more on risk. Um, turning back to markets a little bit, one of the pillars of reform to be us identified three that um, that are important, and, and Wilson did as well. But I think derivatives reform also is an, a, an extremely important pillar of financial reform. So we mandated uh, central clearing through centrally cleared counterparties um, of derivatives transactions, and that uh, that's good. That helps to mutualize counterparty risk, and if you adopt uh, reforms that go along with that, um, you know, good governance of the CCPs and the way the transactions are are conducted, um, that can help actually reduce counterparty risk across the system, but it concentrates risk in the CCPs. So more work needs to be done on assessing what that risk looks like. How should we be stress testing CCPs? How should we assess the risk uh, in them? Um, what does the uh, risk of the clearing members look like? And how, do the, how does the risk from their counterparties affect the risk in the CCPs and therefore in the financial system. This is a classic example of interconnectedness, which is really what a lot of this um, uh, is about. Um, and um, you know, last but not least, I know all of you would be disappointed if I didn't say something about data. Uh, <laughs> we've done a lot to improve the scope, the quality, and maybe even the accessibility of financial data. But I think this is really one of the overlooked areas um, in this kind of analysis. Because if you don't have good data, you're not going to be able to make uh, good policies, you're not going to be able to draw uh, good inferences, you're not going to be able to uh, do good analysis. And I think, you know, there are a lot of data out there, um, and uh, we need to make them more coherent, um, safeguard them, um, protect them, uh, but also make sure that they are available appropriately to people who need them in order to make those decisions, and um, to make them available to academic researchers. Uh, in an appropriate way so that they can do the research that you know we're all talking about here. I'll stop there. Great. Great. Thank you. So I'm going to uh, ask the audience to formulate their questions. And while you're doing that, I'm going to ask a few follow-up questions of our panelists. So um, let me start with you, Dick. And given that you were at the OFR at, as the founding director, you sort of saw up close and personal uh, you know, how data was being used in macrofinancial modeling. What do you see as the successes and failures of that modeling, and what kind of advice can you give this audience for what we can be doing to be more supportive of the efforts that the OFR is undertaking? Sure. Well, to start with the successes, I think um, you know there were uh, some data collections that were initiated as we discovered that we lacked the information that we needed to take a look at uh, what was going on either in markets or institutions. Um, examples of successes I would include the. Uh, the SEC's collection of money market fund data on a granular basis. I think those are, are you know, a, a big advance that started in 2010. Um, and making those accessible, um, you know, I think that's, uh, that's an advance. And so there's been some work done uh, on that score. And I think it's helped inform people's judgment about reforms um, and to also help people's judgment about what the uh, effects of reforms, like the money market reforms, look like, because we saw, obviously, a trillion dollar shift out of prime funds into government-only funds. And knowing exactly who was doing what and who the issuers, who the investors were, I think that, that all um, is helpful. Likewise, uh, there's been an expansion of, um, uh, some expansion of data on um, repo securities financing transactions. Um, and we were involved in uh, one of the expansions to collect data on bilateral uh, repo, the two parts of that. Um, and I think that's really essential because, frankly, if we talk about sources uh, of funding liquidity, that market is uh, extremely important. Um, and so, you know, making progress on that on that score, I think, is is good. Um, but you know, the financial system is constantly evolving, so there are areas where um, you know we're going to need more, and there are areas from the past where we still need more. I would identify. Uh, securities lending is an area where we could probably uh, use some more data. There's some resistance on the part of the industry to make those available. Mm -hmm. um, we discovered in the flash rally of uh, 2014 that we actually had no comprehensive and decent data on treasury cash market transactions. And so FINRA started the collection of those data and uh, 
making those available appropriately to um, you know to researchers and the policymakers, I think, would be uh, pretty important because one of the things we learned in the flash rally was, you know, as everybody in markets understands, you can express a view or take a position in cash and futures and options in a variety of ways on different platforms. Um, and um, we need to be able to link together uh, those data so that we can understand what those uh, what that looks like. And we're not close to being able to do that yet, except um, you know in specific cases. <coughs> um, so those are some of the successes and failures. Great. Thank you. So Nelly, you mentioned something really intriguing, which is that you don't think that um, uh, financial stability and macroprudential policy necessarily needs to be carried out by central banks. <laughs> But given the, um, the the fragmented nature of all of these various different organizations, FSOC, the Financial Stability Council, or Financial Stability Board, what what hope do we have of being able to manage systemic risk by any yeah. single agency? Do you see any possibility or any light in the end of the tunnel? Um, so I think when I say that, I, I do think the central bank has to have an, play an important role. Mm -hmm whether it can be the entity that is like the public face and the accountable entity. I, I do worry, I guess is the word, um, that an entity that already needs independence for monetary policy and will always be a lender of last resort anyway, if they're also viewed as the entity that's responsible for ensuring the system is safe, mm. that just starts to be uncomfortable for many right. governments and countries. Um, so there are com some countries where they've set up a committee and the Ministry of Finance will be the chair. And the central bank um, makes is required to make public recommendations on a number of the time varying kinds of tools like counter cyclical capital. They publish a financial stability report. It could be part of their monetary policy report. They make a public recommendation about CCYB or a public recommendation about LTV on a regular basis. So it could be, I make this recommendation, I don't think it has to change, or I mm -hmm. recommend. And then it's, it's in the public domain, and the Ministry of Finance can decide, you know, based on there's, there's political considerations, there's economic considerations, but then it becomes part of the right. external debate. And I think that establishes some accountability. So there is some ongoing work to see about whether, for us, the li li linking these governance structures to actually what countries are doing in terms of adopting uh, new plans. So, but that's a okay. That was so, my that my is my current recommendation yeah, they, could be changed. Okay, yeah, could I just comment on that? Because uh, back in two thousand nine, I was asked to testify about this issue, and right behind Don Cohn, and, and my view was similar to Don's, which is that the central bank has to play the lead role. Yeah. Um, certainly in, in the analysis, it complements monetary policy and all those good things. I agree with Nellie that, you know, there is this problem that um, if you get too involved in some things that are far afield from monetary policy, that it may compromise politically the independence uh, of the central bank. And that was evident in testimony by some of the other people at that, um, at that mm -hmm. hearing. And, and they were very orthodox about, you know, let's keep monetary policy. Right. Separate, but I don't know how you can uh, keep monetary policy completely separate from from that at all. Um, we all know about the system in the UK, which seems to be a reasonable compromise between those two things. Right. Um, namely, having a committee in which the central bank, um, you know, is involved heavily, but you have other folks who are involved, um, not just the finan finance ministry, but also the people who are responsible for conduct. Uh, financial conduct, because that's an important source of, yep. um, of, uh, of behavioral risk. And, uh, you know, so, but it remains to be seen what's going to give us the best outcomes. Just intuitively, though, the getting agreement um, among a broad group of, of people on who have authority and responsibility that, you know, this is the framework we should be using. This is the, these are the goals that we should be pursuing. Um, and you know, different people have different responsibilities, but getting that agreement, I think, is is so uh, important. Right. Not just within the committee, but across yep. from the elected representatives. Yep. So, Wilson, you wanted to comment on this, and then Tobias. Actually, um, I want to take the opportunity to disagree with, the, with Dick on one item. Um, 
Uh, I'm not sure I agree that we all believe the system is more resilient now. I, I'm frankly on the fence on that. Uh, I think we have a huge win on too big to fail. I think we've really cracked that with the rich exception of Italy. Uh, but I think we have cracked it for the big eight here, in the UK, Switzerland, most of Northern Europe. And I think that's hugely important when you think about when things got really dire in 08 and 09, having a good solution for that, incredibly important. But let's look at the other things. We've lost a lot of flexibility on LOLR in the United States. I think Tim Greitner is right. That it's kind of awkward to have your fire trucks uh, chained to the fire station uh, for when the next crisis comes. That's not a great visual. <laughs> Our capital distance to barrier uh, is much tighter than before. We have a gigantic last taxi problem with liquidity. It's sort of one of those transformer last taxis that probably would go across the Hudson. Um, <laughs> I, I think the stigma attached to breaching LCR uh, as, a, as a bank manager, to be the first one with that orange banner on CNBC saying L LCR less than 100, I ain't going there. I don't want to be number two or number three or number four. I think that is a death spiral. Um, you've had a run on local resources where I think uh, countries are a little bit less willing to trust each other and haven't worked out the protocols for how they would do that. And we've built in a ton of automatism in Title I. Uh, and to the market's point before, that automatism, if we had a systemic crunch, and we use this broadly, which I actually think you, you could do, one of the side effects would be that we would destroy the entire capital markets function in the United States, which I think would also be awkward from a macro perspective. Mm -hmm. So I, if I was going to sum that up, I think we have used regulation to drive a huge amount of safety into the system, but we don't have a dynamic view of how to use that. I think right now that's a gigantic last taxi problem on many dimensions. Uh, and so I worry that without a dynamic, uh, both through time and across borders view of the world, I'm not sure we're so much more resilient. In fact, you might, uh, uh, depending on my mood, I might take the other side of that bet. Mm -hmm. I'm glad to see there's some controversy. Yeah. Hey, yeah. <laughs> Tobias? So let, let me react to, to Wilson and, and to Nelly. So, um, I think what Wilson is saying is that volatility might have become more volatile, <laughs> okay? So, and this is exactly what we saw last year, right? We saw these massive spikes in, in the VIX, not once but twice last year. The first time it was related to technical issues in, in equity markets, and it was very concentrated in equity markets. But then in the fall, it was much broader. It was a worry about global growth and worry about the stance of monetary policy, which subsequently was adjusted and was then associated with a drop in volatility. But I think, um, you know, something that I haven't seen much academic work on, perhaps, but which, you know, many practitioners are sort of like, uh, saying as a story is that, well, on the one hand, we have all this technological advance, right, which is where high frequency trading, automated trading is a lot more important. So this is squeezing market, traditional market makers out of the business, right? So like, you know, having a, a, a regular trading floor is just is, is just no longer profitable given that there are all these high frequency shops and even the dealers are now doing high frequency trading. So this is one evolution and the other evolution is a lot higher capital and a lot higher liquidity. So the cost of running the business is, as he was saying, somewhat higher. And that in equilibrium might generate a different uh, behavior of asset prices where volatility is more volatile. So these sharp tightening of financial conditions that we have seen last year might become more frequent. Now, I don't think that this is going to trigger another 2008 crisis because there is so much more capital and liquidity, but we might see a lot sharper swings in prices, and that is macro-critical in my view. So I think that when uh, financial conditions tighten a lot, that increases downside risk to macro activity tremendously. And so from a macro, macro financial point of view, I think we are very risky, but not from a systemic risk a la 2008 type of uh, uh, point of view. All right. Before the panel concludes, I'm going to ask each one of you to tell us what keeps you up at night and what you're worried about for systemic uh, uh, risk. But before that, let's get to the audience with uh, questions. Anybody have questions? Uh, yes. And maybe can we get the microphone? Do we have a microphone somewhere that we can sort of run? <laughs> 
Oh, here, okay. I think now it is, okay. Can you introduce yourself? Sure, Mani Shirora, Rational Investing. And the question I have is regarding the reduction in systemic risk. I'm wondering if your views incorporate the ETF market, because what it seems to me may have happened is you've shifted credit risk from banks to ETFs to achieve certain ratios. So the triple B to GDP, triple B outstanding to GDP ratio is up five times in 20 years. And there's a couple of trillion in ETFs at Vanguard or BlackRock that didn't even exist 10 years ago. So if you have a downturn, the Fed, instead of calling Bank of America and lending them 100 billion, is out bidding for ETFs. Is that so working? Yeah, there's a very nice yeah. paper in the Journal of Finance last year that had an identification strategy to basically ask whether shares that are relatively more held by ETFs are relatively more uh, volatile. So basically asking, you know, whether the presence of more ETFs generates some sort of like more, more volatility in equilibrium. And apparently there is some evidence of that. There's also another literature where people look at emerging markets and they tend to find a similar effect. So that, you know, the benchmarking in the ETFs and, and passive investment might actually have some, uh, some impacts on volatility. Yeah. Rama, in the back. And then Lars. So Ramakant, University of Oxford. So uh, Tobias mentioned that we have a lot more capital and the liquidity on balance sheet, in particular this number of 20% of liquid assets on balance sheet compared to 4% 10 years ago. So it seems like everything is a lot safer from this point of view. But I would, like to, I would also like to note that the pressure on the bank's liquidity is much higher now, given the framework we have introduced in the regulation in the past 10 years, in particular, as you know, there are many requirements now uh, with regard to central clearing and collateral requirements, which were not present in 2008. And um, I, I don't think the li liquidity stress tests that are administered either by supervisors <laughs> or the bank themselves really take this into account in a, in a quantitative way. In particular, for example, if you look at LCR, LCR does look at some average of margin calls in the past uh, uh, one year or two years, but uh, we're not coming out of a, sh a large shock scenario. So this historical average may not correspond to what would happen in a stress scenario. So uh, considering that large margin calls were what really hit the banks into 2008, and and it was through the liquidity channel that these banks were uh, were failing, I, I would question, you know, whether uh, with the much higher requirements in terms of collateral and liquidity that are in place now, whether the next you know, crisis would not come really through the liquidity channel and whether focusing exclusively on capital requirements is not just uh, uh, making us uh, not pay attention to what would be potentially an explosive uh, situation there. I think liquidity is probably likely to be the speediest immediate cause of death uh, probably augmented by chronic solvency problems that seem, I think that dynamic of 08 we may well see again because liquidity is the thing that happens most fit, uh, quickly at the, uh, when you're on the deathbed. Uh, I do think people have, at least this generation has a pretty good memory for what killed Lehman, what killed Bear, and some of the size of those shocks. So I don't think that is going to be a surprise. What I do worry about is the regulatory required equity. This thing we talked about before with the last taxi, something Andy Haldane once described as the concrete airbag, which is <laughs> if you're having a liquidity accident and the bag does not have any buffer in it, but instead is a concrete airbag, you're not going to feel a lot safer. <laughs> um, so I, I, more capital requirement. Yeah. <laughs> so I, this is where I worry that, that some of the dynamics of liquidity uh, may well be one of the things that really hurts us and that we haven't I think we haven't really thought through the stigma yep. issues, the last right. taxi issue, <clears throat> how to manage that through the next crisis. We built up a lot, and we built up trillions. But can we use it? Or do we just have to keep it and lug it around with us forever? Yeah, the solution for the last taxi problem is Uber, right? So <laughs> yeah, we gotta, we got to figure out the Uber. It's not a central bank. It's not a central bank. That's right. the issue. Okay. All right. Uh, Lars? Uh, 
I was a little bit confused about this discussion about who should be doing macroprudential risk. So, so Dick pointed out that, well, maybe we, one reason to not load it all onto the monetary authorities is, 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 is that that might politicize monetary policy more. But do we want macroprudential policy to be uh, politicized, and how do we avoid it being politicized? And the more that we engage these different regulatory bodies talk, you know, talking to each other, you know, when does this become something that's very political in nature? And, and, and how can one design this in a way that has any form of, that, that insulates itself from the political process going down the road? Um, and, and, then the, and then the other question is, at what point do we start worrying about the type of regulations um, where oversights were asking, requiring too much on the regulators in terms of their, in terms of their knowledge base and the like, in the sense of, <clears throat> you've been very clear to point out that it would be nice to have better, deeper understandings in a, in, in a variety of places, and over time maybe we can produce it. But you know, you're you're in the hot seat now and have to do certain forms of regulation. When is it concerns about we're doing things that are kind of complicated or not so clear, and it opens the door to regulatory discretion, and that becomes problematic? Okay. Also, a couple points. Um, sort of had. So let me just talk about the um, complication of policies, and especially for supervisors. I think the stress test had some advantages of the sense of um, while they are complicated and they involve massive amounts of data, they're designed really so that the banks themselves will organize their data and keep their data and maintain their data, so they themselves can manage these and estimate their risks and. I think we're, everyone here would be, is, was pretty surprised by the lack of infrastructure of data management in 2007 and 8. And so it's, it's, so you know, you try to create supervisory processes that isn't about taking it all on to the supervisors, but you know, giving, provide, you know, giving them the right incentives to do that. And I think, you know, to the extent you can do that. And I think that's true on the liquidity stress test, too. A good part of the liquidity stress test is just the firms being able to report what goes in and out yeah. every day. And um, that's something that is, you know, anyway, the incentives are set up to that way. And we have seen improvements in risk management that have paralleled the improvements in our ability to assess and uh, identify risks. Um, in the financial system, and and both of those are important. And I think what needs to happen going forward um, is to have a better dialogue, keeping you know that that avoids regulatory capture, but a better dialogue between the people who manage risk in firms and the people who are overseeing risk in the financial system as a whole. So that I think that can happen, but um, that that's really important for getting people on board with the idea that they have common goals and. That takes away some of the political dynamic to it. But the politics are always going to be there. And I think one of the critical distinctions is that, uh, as Paul Tucker has noted, you have to separate how much resilience you want in the financial system, if we can calibrate that, from the way that we go about identifying threats to financial stability and the technocratic uh, kind of implementation of the policy uh, that, that we implement to, uh, to mitigate it. Yes. Yeah, so the IMF actually assesses uh, the financial sector setup from a very institutional point of view, and uh, in particular assesses the macroprudential setup in countries. And so we give recommendations uh, as to how uh, macroprudential policy frameworks should be should be governed. Uh, we have done this for 20 years, and the macroprudential has come in focus over the past 10 years since the last crisis. And you know, for example, the U.S. is going to be assessed next year. At the moment, we are in Italy. Uh, we did China last year. So it's a it's a it's a very deep dive assessment. And so, in general, in general, we don't give a recommendation as to whether the Treasury or the central bank or or the prudential regulator should share the macroprudential. <coughs> In our view, there are governance setups that work with all of these arrangements, but the devil is really in the details. It's really about how many tools are there, how independent is the body that is set up, and um, how, uh, how is the de decision process structured. So I think there are models where the Treasury is in charge, there are models where the central bank is in charge that can work in principle, but the devil is really in the details on how many powers there are, how many tools there are, 
how the decisions are taken. Um, you know, in terms of sort of like macroeconomic uh, depth, it does tend to be true across uh, countries in the world that most macro expertise tends to be concentrated in central banks as opposed to in treasuries. And uh, that is certainly, you know, one consideration, but it's not the only consideration. Oh. Well, well, having said that, what do you guys think about FSOC? I mean, is, is FSOC heading in the right direction in dealing with some of these issues? I don't think so. No. <laughs> I think that they've walked back from their responsibility to um, really uh, identify and mitigate threats to financial stability um, and to promote <laughs> discipline. And, and one of the things that concerns me, you know, in terms of the keeping me up at night <laughs> is that actually that puts a, a more of a burden on monetary policy to right. respond to these things because of what Nelly talked about in terms of the way that, um, you know, we haven't used the counter-cyclical capital buffer in the United States, even though it's on the books. Um, you know, that does, that puts more of a burden on, uh, on monetary policy per right. se. So the tools that FSOC have are designation, uh, which has been used, but is basically, you know, being unwound more or less. And uh, it has the section 120 of Dot Frank, which allows uh, FSOC to force an agency to implement certain measures. This has been used or was threatened to be used once for the money market fund reform, but the bar is very high to use it. So in terms of the governance setup, you know, you, there aren't many proper macro prudential pools. In, in fact, the CCYB is done by the Fed, not by the council. Um, you know, mortgage underwriting standards are not really a tool in the U.S. because most of that is done either at the state level, it's not done at the federal level. There's a and, job um, the can do. They're, right. they're, they're the council could identify those right. through the banks, yeah. through yeah. the banks, but not on the market-wide system, yeah. right? To the extent that more than half of mortgages nowadays are originated outside of banks, yeah. right. that can do very little. Right. Nelly? So, um, among our 47, 58 countries, FSOC is actually in the top tier in terms of <laughs> organizational structure. And, um, and so, you know, in my view, I think having the Ministry of Finance involved is, may not be as productive from a, you know, like as an economist view of, of something, but again, whether the central bank could take on the SEC or the CFTC or, you know, and what, what kind it would do there. It could be a lot better if the central bank was, in some sense, a secretariat and is sort of like a secretariat and makes recommendations. Mm -hmm. Right now, the central bank is one among equal among everybody, and so it's the agenda is driven by a political body, and so that is, to me, yeah. is an issue. But they do have a comply or explain, which puts them again in the top tier of institutions mm -hmm. that are out there right now. So. Yeah, I fully agree that most countries around the world have, have uh, fairly strong weaknesses in terms of the governance of, of Michael yeah. Dutch. Okay. Wilson, did you have a comment, Wilson? No, okay. I think I heard 20 or 30 thesis topics uh, just uh, in that few minutes. I hope you guys are taking notes. Uh, we're out of time, um, and I want to conclude by, uh, on, on behalf of the MFM group, thanking each of you, not just for being on the panel, but for all that you've done for financial stability. Each of you have made tremendous contributions over the last few years in your careers, uh, and it's been a real privilege and pleasure for you to be involved in MFM. So thank you very much. Okay.